Welcome back. I first off want to remind everybody that our lead singers from the Metropolitan Tannhäuser and also the orchestral players played a Tannhäuser performance last night, uh, ending probably after 11.30. So though the Pope's staff may not have erupted in leaves, it's still something of a miracle that they've graciously consented to be here with us. <laughs> Otto Schenk's staging has witnessed a profusion of great singers, start, starting with an Austrian and American team, James McCracken in his only Wagnerian venture besides Fro, Leonie Riesenek in a part she sang for over three decades, Grace Bumbry in the role that brought her world fame at Bayreuth as their first black leading artist, Bernd Weichel making his debut, uh, John McCurdy, and Catherine, Kathleen Battle making her debut as the shepherdess. Shepherd, oh excuse me. <laughs> Again this year, we are lucky to have the world's Wagnerian elite at work, of whom we have four as our guests today. Again, it's an international enterprise with Scottish conductors for Donner Chronicles, Austrian tenor Andreas Schager, who could not be here today, but we're lucky to have German baritone and bass Christian Gerhar and Georg Zeppenfeld, along side Russian mezzo Ekaterina Gubanova and South African soprano Elsa von der Hefer. Let me add that in 45 years now of live Tannhäuser going, I've never heard a more beautifully sung Bitterolf than that of the Met's young artist, Le Bu, from China. It's maybe the first Bitterolf I've ever heard that sounds like he wouldn't be thrown out of a singing competition. <laughs> so let me join you. I hope neither of you has sung Bitterolf. I have. Oh, okay, well, they obviously didn't throw you out of the singing competition. Well, I'm sure your people are familiar with your careers, but I'd like to say a few words about them. Uh, Georg Zeppenfeld, our Landgraf, has been based in Dresden for two decades, but sings internationally in repertories, Browning, Beethoven, Mozart, Verdi. I had the pleasure of hearing his 2009 Met debut as Zarastro. I think it's fair to say you're considered the successor in the basso cantante roles of Wagner, of just the ones I've heard, uh, René Papa, Kurt Moll, and Hans Zotin, uh, who was your, te was your, your teacher, uh, and sings Daland, uh, the Kings, Heinrich and Marke, Gournemans, and Bogner, with uh, this, you may have read, Hans Sachs on the Horizon in several major theaters. <laughs> Elsa von der Heffer, originally from Cape Town, you've also made an international career with early training uh, 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 breakthrough. At Johannesburg. <laughs> Johannesburg, not Cape Town. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> Don't believe everything you read. Joburg, of course. Don't believe everything you read on the internet. You've shown your versatility at the Met and elsewhere with roles by Donizetti, Britton, Mozart, Berg, and Richard Strauss. You've sung Lohengrin in Zurich and Berlin, and earlier this year made a splendid role debut at, at Zenta at the Met, and then again in Santa Fe. Uh, no one would have guessed it from your very confident presentation and portrayal, but this production marks your role debut as Elisabeth. Mm -hmm. Yekaterina Gubanova, born in Moscow, Correct? That's true. <laughs> not Peter, not St. Petersburg. You enjoyed early successes at Covent Garden and sing a stylistically diverse repertory, bel canto, Russian opera, Verdi, and Berlioz, as well as Wagner. I'd, maybe Brangena would be your signature role in Wagner, but you've done both Frickas and the Erda and Rheingold, Ortrud and Kundry, several of these roles at Bayreuth. I noticed in September's Wagner notes, Hermann Gramp wrote of your last season of the revival of the Tobias Kratzer staging in Berkeley. Yekaterina Gubanova as Venus is a great singing actress who would have been to Wagner's liking. Yes. Oh, that's yes. <laughs> Christian Gahar, you are best known in New York as a leader singer, both from recitals and recordings with your longtime collaborator, Gerald Huber. 
In fact, Jeffrey Broder, in March's Wagner Notes, rating of the Boston Symphony's Act Three performance, Christian Gaffar sang with his usual leader sensitivity in both meaning and pronunciation, but he did not spare power and strength when needed. He offered a master class in the role. There is no finer Wolfram among contemporary baritones. Like other singers who have a our other singers who have a gallery encompassing Berg, Hansa, Debussy, Mozart, Verdi. I was very struck in listening on Wednesday to the Tannhäuser. Uh, people talk about the Lohengrin having bel canto connections, but triplets all over the place. And because you've sung Bellini and Donizetti and Mozart, your ability to provide the uh, triplets that, uh, that Wagner asks for in these roles. My first question is to all of you, um, have, had you seen Tannhäuser before you performed in it? And what was your response, either on video or in live performance? Yes, I liked it very much. <laughs> <laughs> where, where was it? Uh, I saw my first Tannhäuser in uh, San Francisco. I saw it in Japan. And um, I saw it in Bordeaux. Yeah, I've seen it a couple of times. I always thought I would sing the role. Um, I started singing in 2007, so I don't know why it took so long, but here we are. <laughs> I love the music. <laughs> well, I haven't seen it live before I started singing, actually. Uh, Venus, uh, but I've seen several, obviously, several DVD recordings and stuff, so... Oh, sorry! sorry. <laughs> uh, I haven't seen it live before I started singing Venus, so that's... Uh, that's my answer. <laughs> I've seen my first uh, Tannhäuser as a student uh, or as a, as a pupil of uh, a German Wagner Society in Bayreuth. And uh, I was privileged to hear my voice teacher, Hans Soltin, as Landgraf. And this was the most important thing for me uh, because I then decided I had to become his student because he knew how to do everything which I could not do at that time. Hmm. And uh, so it was a very special moment. I also heard him as Gornemans in, in, in Parsifal. And it was a very special moment for me in 2016 when I sang in this theater the same role after having thought I would probably never sing here. And I would, of course, never sing Gornemans. But at some, some point it happened. It was very moving. Uh, yes, uh, I, I have seen Tannhäuser live only uh, once. It was during my studies in Munich, and it was a new production of uh, David Alden, uh, most hated. It was the typical uh, so-called Eurocrap. I love it. I loved it. It was it was very very smart, and uh, the um, I, I remember uh, a parts of the cast. It was René Collo. He's uh, together with. Uh, this wonderful colleague we are missing today, Andrea Schager, uh, my favorite uh, Tannhäuser, and maybe together with uh, Peter Seifert. But he was, I mean, he was just amazing. His recording of, of Tannhäuser is uh, outstanding in my eyes, my ears. Uh, but it was already kind of a little, um, his late years, and, and, he, and Bernd Weichel was Wolfram, and in the Rome tale, uh, it was so funny. He was he was shaking Bernd Weichel in the rhythm of his vibrato, Aww. and it was I, and it was it was just great. And we were uh, nasty young students and uh, standing in the fifth balcony in Munich State's Opera, and were uh, oh, we were shaken by laughter. <laughs> it was it was just amazing, but. Still, he was certainly the uh, outstanding Tannhäuser of his time, Ernie Koller, and it was, it was wonderful. Also, I have specific questions for you, but I want to ask another general question is, uh, we heard a presentation about the different versions, the four different, but commonly thought of as two different versions, Dresden and Paris. And have any of you appeared, uh, I know I, I talked to Mr. Zeppenfeld, who, is based in Dresden and where they still do essentially the Dresden version. But what are your, if you have, what are your thoughts on, I know for Els that's not a fair question, it's a debutante, but the rest of you, have you uh, appeared 
ever in the in the Dresden version. Of course, because Bayreuth does only Dresden version. So yeah, that's uh, it's less developed as a as a character for Venus. Uh, but we're not talking about Bayreuth production because it's all built around Venus anyway. If she mm. if she sings less, it doesn't matter. But uh, <laughs> Paris version is is more interesting, of course, um, artistically and singing wise. It's a larger range, I, I believe. Yes, it is. It's more of a mezzo. The aria is half toned down, which is a blessing because all these <laughs> all these sharps is really really difficult to tune into them. But uh, for me, at least. But uh, yeah, Paris version is is. Is more of everything. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you mentioned you before. Said you're used to it. Yeah. 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 You mentioned before we do the Dresden version in Dresden, apparently, and uh, <laughs> uh, it doesn't affect the role of the landgraf. So for me, it doesn't make Lucky a difference. You. <laughs> Lucky um, you. Um, the, sorry. Would you like to sing? Something? I've never. I, I, it's my first time, so I've only done the Paris version. That's okay. it. That, okay. Nothing else to contribute. I, I mostly perform uh, Wolfram in the in the Vienna version, if I'm right. This combination of Dresden and Paris, uh, I I think it's a good solution. Uh, I think the Dresden version is a little poor, uh, and dramaturgically, from the musical aspect, it's certainly more uh, cohesive. It's consistent, self-consistent, uh, more pure. But I think exactly this, uh, f the fact that um, Tannhäuser, together with uh, uh, Meistersinger certainly, is one of these fantastic and fascinating operas uh, thinking about singing itself, so it's self-inflicted, uh, uh, is makes it very interesting for me to have a a uh, more um, diverse approach to what singing is. I, I'm not affected by the by the fact that Tannhäuser, uh, that Wagner was uh, mentioning in his last years. I, I owe Tannhäuser to the world. Uh, uh, I don't. I don't think musically. I'm. I'm concerned. So I love uh, the Paris version, but I certainly miss. Uh, during the uh, singers' contest, uh, Walter's lead, which is helping a lot psychologically, which is uh, um, uh, explaining um, the the provocation uh, that Wolfram is uh, in his second uh, contest song, "O uh, Himmel, lass dich jetzt erfliehen," better than just with this one. Uh, reply of Tannhäuser and the uh, certainly Bitterov song. Um, so I I miss Walter's lead, but on the other hand, seeing uh, this situation on stage, uh, um, Tannhäuser getting up and wondering, oh my God, I have a kind of inspiration, uh, and and having this genius moment is very. Is very uh, uh, deep and, and and great, and I love it. So I'm I'm not sure how to how to have a solution. Uh, just for this uh, comment of Wagner, I owe uh, Tannhäuser to the world. I think he also owed it in uh, dramatical uh, um, uh, reasons because I always think to myself, why is Elizabeth, for instance, just disappearing and saying? Oh, I'm going to die now. It's it's not explained enough. I think there are some some lacks also in the drama, not only in, in the music, but altogether uh, this disruptive drama, uh, drama and this disruptive uh, um, uh, musical style uh, in the Paris version. I, I love it. Uh, I think it's 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 very uh, apt to the person uh, of Tannhäuser himself, who is such a genius, but uh, can't, is, is disruptive in his person and is, is disrupted in his all life. Can't bring together uh, bourgeois and artistic uh, um, aspects of his life. Mm. Well, it's interesting. It does make a very big dramatic difference in that scene of the songs to have more built before the, the eruption. 
I have a question uh, in terms of Elizabeth and Venus and their different endings in the different versions. I want to ask both of our, our ladies, Katrina Gubanova and Elsa van der Hever. I'm sure you know there's a tradition of having one artist sing, there are many artists who sing both roles at different times, all of Fremstadt. Actually, Grace Bumbry's only other Wagner role on stage was Elisabeth, which she did it in Berlin. Blanche Tebum, who was always in the United States, of Venus, when she went to her parents' home country of Sweden, she sang Elisabeth, said it was a wonderful experience, but her agent told her, never offer it again, because people will think you're becoming a soprano and stop asking for <laughs> Dalila and Carmen. But there's an even rarer feat of one artist singing both roles in the same performance. At the Met, it's only been done by Birgit Nielsen in the old Met, 1966, where she recorded both. Uh, Gwyneth Jones does, did so at Bayreuth in the early 70s. It's so a Goetz Friedrich production. It fortunately was filmed. And so I guess it's a multi-partite question. Oh, would you consider singing Venus? Would you consider singing Elisabeth? And both of you, would you be interested in singing both in the same production. <laughs> well, I mean, I do love the music of Elizabeth very much. It's this, this sort of pure, there's a lot of bel canto there. It's, it's much healthier than the intervals of Venus, all, the, all these leaps and things that I have to do. Uh, mm, theoretically, it would be nice to sing Elizabeth, but I don't think it's for my color of the voice does not suit it. I don't think so. Uh, for me, no. I, I mean, the answer is obviously no. <laughs> the, the, I'm not blessed with the, with the rich, heavy, supported sound in the bottom of my instrument. Neither have I. <laughs> <laughs> so it's already a struggle. I mean, I, I will say I think Elizabeth is probably the lowest role I have ever attempted. And... Um, it's, it's, it's a very middle heavy, middle of the range heavy, and for this reason alone, I couldn't possibly imagine having to do both, so I would never consider it. <laughs> and uh, I think I stick to Elizabeth, whom I love very much. I like, I like the music very much. But I will say at the end of the night, where normally if I have just come off the stage of any Strauss role I sing, I could sing the role again, because it just sits that well in my instrument, whereas this role, I come off stage and I'm like, I am like, <coughs> <laughs> you only just started in the film. <laughs> no, but maybe that will evolve, I don't know, but the role sits very low. It actually really does sit very low. Um, so no, that's a no for me. Okay. <laughs> no is, is going out to the world. Uh, Mr. Zeppenfeld, you're, you sing so many of these Wagner Basso roles, what are the special challenges of La, the Landgraf, either technically or vocally? If there are, you don't have to heavy lift the way that <laughs> König Heinrich does in his first measures on stage. It's a G. Uh, what, do, what do you find difficult? What do you find puzzling and interesting about the role? Um, it's not, I think the, the, the Landgraf, Landgraf is not of one of the, the most difficult roles to sing in the Wagner repertoire. It is. Um, it is a little bit on the high side in the <coughs> solo phrases, and he's always low in the in the ensembles. So I was, um, as I mentioned before, I have sung Bitterov when I did my first uh, uh, Tannhauser production in Dresden. I had to, I'm a member of the, of the ensemble, but I didn't like it because it was too high for me, and it was too much of, of a, a black character. So I imagine Bitterov, ideally, as uh, a singer who has done lots of Wotans before, and shortly before he retires, <laughs> <laughs> he seems better off. This would be the ideal, uh, the ideal color that I imagine for this for this character. And if we have a, have a young singer, as we have here, with a brilliant uh, voice and g uh, uh, good technique, the production should make something out of it. We should use this youthful mm -hmm. person to give better off a different color, but. This normally doesn't happen, so for me, changing to the Landgrave was like coming home. So this is in the, in the center of my, my vocal means, and I love it very, very much because it's, um, 
It is a more interesting character than, for example, King Henry. King Henry is very... It's a kind of early Wagnerian um, um, secondary role, I would call it, because he uh, he's more a stereotype of a king. He comes on stage with a lot of brass playing, then he makes a speech, and then he goes into standby until the next speech is to be waited. <laughs> and so it's, it's like digital, on and off, and there's not much development in the character. He's not, he's not important for the drama. He starts it, he does a lot in the first act, and then he gets less and less important, which is typical for uh, many uh, Wagner operas and Wagner roles. Um, the important ones, they come out towards the end of the opera to, to make the final scene big and important. This, this is interesting and it is good like this, but it doesn't make the secondary characters more interesting. Uh, I think the Landgrave is different. He is, he is of course, he's diminishing uh, in his importance of the, uh, of the event, but um, I feel much more interesting colors in this character. He is very much involved in the problems of his niece, uh, Elizabeth, and he, he really cares for his people. He is not only a political guy who wants to win a war against the Hungarians, as King Henry does, but he's, he's caring for, for, of course, for, 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 the, for, the, for the values of his country, of, of his, uh, the community which he lives in. And on the other hand, he's caring for, for the life of Elizabeth and her, her pursuit of happiness. And this conflicts with one another when he, when he finds tanners in the forests. And so this conflict makes the person more interesting. And this is something you, you, you have an opportunity to, 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 to show more on stage of this complex character. And that makes it more attractive to me. I actually wanted to ask about that, since I should remind you that Wagner wrote Elisabeth for his own niece, Johanna, who was 19 when she premiered it. He wanted it to be on her birthday. She was ill and waited a few days. So I think there's you know, Wagner inserting his paternal feeling or his parietal feeling, I guess we should say, since it's uh, uncle and niece. But since you also have sung Daland and uh, uh, Zen uh, and, uh, and Pogner, so you're used to dealing with daughters, does he know the extent of her love for for Tannhäuser, he asks about the secret, the sweet secret to reveal it. Does, does he really know fully what's going on with her? I think he does, because he has experienced what, what, uh, what Elizabeth was going through over the years when Tannhäuser was away from the court. And she, she, was, she was suffering. She was suffering hard. And I think also the fact that Landgraf Hamann, he, he takes a risk by re-inviting Tannhäuser uh, to his court, because he, he knows there might be a new conflict, and we might, we, might, we might risk all of our cultural identity again uh, when he returns, and if he, does, if, he, if he doesn't change his character, or if he hasn't changed his character over the time. And so I think he knows about it. And Elsa, how do you feel? Uh, in that interaction, the brief, it's a very brief personal scene, and it's really one of Heinrich's few personal expressions in the opera when he's questioning you. No, it's very, it's very intimate. I love working with Georg because it's because I do. He he sort of feels fatherly to me, and um, I don't know. It's that awkward thing where you try to talk to your parents about relationships. I, <laughs> <laughs> it is awkward, um, but beautiful and intimate and. I, I, I love this tiny little interaction, but also during during the singer fest and during during the this awful dismantlement of the situation we're in. There's we we are sort of like still in character. I mean, we never break character, so that's really that's really nice to work with somebody that's um, that committed on stage. I love it. <laughs> But isn't it interesting that it's mostly in Wagner operas, it's mostly not the fathers who care for their daughters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, is, it is the uncle in this, who has mm. this positive relationship. If you look mm -hmm. at, at Daland and uh, also at Pogner, 
they are only busy to get them to get them married mm. in, 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 yeah. in, with some advantage for themselves <laughs> so maybe maybe as Wagner is mirroring his own life in, the, in many of his operas, mm. maybe this, he has not a, not a good idea of fathers. <laughs> well, then there's Wotan and Brunhilde. Exactly. Yeah. And Sieglinde. And Sieglinde. Yeah. And Sieglinde. Much more complicated yeah. question. It's always problematic. Well, actually, I wanted to ask all of you about this uh, question. It occurred to me something that never occurred to me uh, until Wednesday, and I think this is the tenth time I've seen this production, and I think it's the depth of your portrayals, is what exactly happened? Why did Tannhäuser leave? There's, it's spoken of, even Venus knows about it. She says to him, you're going to go back to those people who were so terrible to you. Why do you want to do that? But the rest of you, it's just referred to, Wolfram brings it up, that there was his arrogance before and that there was something precipitated it. How do you conceive of what, what went on? That Why did he leave? Why did he leave Elizabeth? Why did he leave the, the Menesinger circle? What, what exactly? How do you... Oh, you see? mean originally? Like originally, years, yes, yes. Oh, yeah. Prior. No, not, not home, but the first time. Why did he go away? Um, well, I think of him as like a rock singer that takes drugs. And, <laughs> and I think he fell off the wagon. I mean, honestly, that's, that's really how I... If I have to look at it in today's terms, you know, um, good girl sort of falling in love with the dangerous guy... That's how I think about it. I mean, honestly, I, I think he, he probably needed some soul searching and he found it. I, I don't know. I mean, that's how I look at it yeah. personally. I need a minute. <laughs> Next. Oh, absolutely. It's different from Vena's point of view yeah, because yeah, 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 she, yeah. she sees it from afar and I want to ask you about that as well. But how about you? When you, know, you refer, Wolfram refers to what went on before, and obviously has a stake in it in relation to Elizabeth and their competition for her. But what, what happened? Yeah, well, I, I'm not sure whether anything happened. I think the question is crucial to the whole opera. Uh, I would say Tanoza left because he couldn't stand these square blokes anymore, yeah. <laughs> these ungifted idiots. Uh, <laughs> Uh, especially the, I mean, the, the most horrible is Peter Rolf. He's so dumb, and uh, I mean, he he says, when I am in love, I draw my sword. Yeah, and I, this is this is this is so embarrassing. Tanner <laughs> hardly can can stand this uh, during uh, uh, to, to to listen to Peter Rolf. But uh, it's not only these square blokes, but also Wolfram. Uh, Please forgive if I accept, uh, accept my own role. Uh, he's uh, his real counterpart because Tannhäuser is a genius. Wolfram is not. Tannhäuser is a natural. Uh, Wolfram is not. He's an intellectual. Uh, Tannhäuser is synthetic. Wolfram is analytic. And Tannhäuser is, however, uh, struggling between, as I said, bourgeois and artist. And uh, Wolfram is struggling between being a platonic lover and arguing for platonic love and being drawn to Elizabeth uh, in a very, very uh, sexual way, I think. But he can't admit it to himself. So uh, Tannhäuser couldn't stand this anymore. And uh, Wolfram certainly understands that he can't stand them. And he's, he can't stand them either. Uh, I mean, when he when he meets Tannhäuser and and these and uh, his companions say, "Yeah, what are you doing here?" But if you come, behave, and we don't like you, but we need you. Uh, but uh, Wolfram answers clearly, "We have to have him back in order to get Elizabeth. She 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 wouldn't be interested uh, in being with us." And uh, he certainly understands uh, concerning it. Uh, concerning Petrov, Walter, uh, Heinrich, and, and Reimer, uh, but he knows that he, she doesn't love him. So the tragic uh, uh, origin of this opera is, I think, a little bit in this last scene of first act, showing that uh, Wolfram has to re-invite him, get him back, in order to see Elizabeth again, which he, he needs to see her because he's so infatuated with her. But on the other hand, he knows at the same point uh, it will be the union of Tannhäuser with Elizabeth. 
because she loves him and he maybe loves her as well. Uh, so it is a, a tragic decision he has to take. And, and out of this decision, I think the whole horror in the second act and third act certainly uh, um, um, has its origin. Yeah. Good what? answer. And for Venus, we now know what Elizabeth sees in Tannhäuser, the, the bad boy rock star. How does he get to Venus, do you feel? Uh, does he find you? Do you find him? You're driving along in your van from Bayreuth and you see him, <laughs> see him hitchhiking. This will filter, stick with me forever. <laughs> like Brad Pitt. How does, how does it work in your mind? How, how does, what does she see in him and how does, how does he get to the Venus floor? Well, I think he's driven by, by the desire. I mean, my, my answer obviously is not going to be so complicated. <laughs> but he's driven by desire of, of change. So he gets enough of one thing and he wants the exact opposite. It's like you can, you can see men marrying the opposite women <laughs> all the time. So it's, it's, uh, it's this sort of... Um, and, and being a goddess, I guess, she's everywhere. Um, so it's not a physical place that he needs to be in to find her. It's just... She's there. Um, yeah. And he... He can summon her up, but it seems that in some ways like you have a magic mirror, as in Disney or The Wizard of Oz, where you can see what's yes, happening. Yes, because I think even for her, uh, he's special. He's not like any other uh, mortal, I think. Um, he's an artist. He's, yeah, he's an artist. He's an exceptional artist. And uh, yeah, he, she, she feels for him. Something. She maybe what, what I like thinking when I'm in it, when I'm on stage with all these uh, m m manipulations and mood changes that she has. I like thinking that there is a fight inside her between uh, a woman and a goddess. So there, there is something still in her that that is very woman-like, very real, and then. The goddess takes over, and this and and the the human. I think she is, um, her woman part is attracted to Tannhäuser. Mm. As a goddess, she would care much less. I think. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Well, people uh, discuss this production as being extremely traditional and following all of Wagner's mm -hmm. intentions. I want to ask you all about that. But there's one major, it occurred to me again, seeing it again, there's one major uncanonical touch in this production. I don't think anyone re tends to remark on it. I think maybe Andrew Porter originally, in 1970, pointed out. At the end of the Elisabeth Tannhäuser reconciliation duet, which musically comes from Fidelio or uh, the realm of von Faber, uh, Wolfram reappears. And he's in the background and says, uh, So flieht für dieses Leben mir jede Hoffnung shine. Uh, thus vanishes for this life my every gleam of hope. And in this production, we see him at first, and then he goes off and doesn't reappear. And that's actually quite a major change. So, of course, I want to ask you about that, of how that changes your trajectory as the romantic rival. Yes, you're right. Uh, I, I, I miss this sentence, uh, not uh, as a singer, because it's it's relatively low and not, not nice to sing, but uh, it doesn't matter. I think f for the drama it's, it's necessary to, to, to show uh, the, the conflict uh, of, of uh, Wolfram in every possible way. And this would contribute to, to make people understand that Wolfram is so horribly in love with her and is so horribly suffering seeing him there and, and, uh, and her asking these questions which are absolutely going in the same direction, like, oh my God, finally you're back, and why, why have you been away, and all this. So he, he's suffering horribly, and I think he should not come back. He, he should stay all the tune, yeah. certainly, and, uh, or at least until this point, mm -hmm. and, and, and be crucified by, by this dialogue, and especially uh, um, that can be shown this situation that Elizabeth is talking about the singers singing in the hall and a lovely singing, but I mean, she 
and and he's oh my god yes she's talking about me <laughs> and and then she says yeah but i missed you and then she's off uh <laughs> so very sorry uh, for myself so <laughs> it is uh, we are missing this uh, line i think and it's not understandable why it's cut because it's it doesn't have to do anything with 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 paris or Dresden version yeah no I've, I've i've never understood said why that's cut either but in relation to this traditional, very uh, romantic, in the, in the capital R sense of production, what's it like for, for our three veterans of Tom Horses? You've been in productions with Wolfram, you know, sticking a throat, a gun down his throat for the song to the evening star, strangling Elizabeth uh, for, in the song to the evening star, and driving a, a minivan and picking up a clown and so forth. <laughs> What's it like for you to be in this extremely traditional visual production? Does it add, what does it add? Uh, does it feel odd to you, especially as performers basically based in Europe, to, to be in such a production? I just wanted your, your thoughts on that. Well, if I may say, I have done, before this production, I have done uh, many times Stanhoys in different places, always modern. I have never done the original, uh, the, the traditional production, so this this is a a, a present for me. I must say, just uh, not because not because I prefer always traditional productions, but for a change. And it's it was also uh, it proved to be a challenge uh, as as an actress because I just had all the modern gestures in me, and I still have to control it a lot whilst being a goddess and not to do something like. You know, which is really, I mean, it could be terrible if I slip into this. But uh, what I have seen uh, is, of course, is Venus. I'm free during the second act this time. Uh, so I went to see from, from the wings the, the second act. It, it, it brought me to tears, not, not because of, of, of the drama, but just because of how I, I felt like a kid, you know, everything was real. It was happening for real, like like those kids in Disneyland, they go and see, Daddy, I told you that Mickey Mouse was real, you know? It's this, this, <laughs> there was, it was fantastic. I, I, I love it. I love it. Yeah. For me, this was maybe the first production of Tannhauser, um, which I did not consider silly. Because it's uh, this this tra traditional staging, it it opens space. There are there are long. It, it doesn't answer all the questions, of course, but it offers me space to fill in what I feel about the figure. I can think my role straight on, as it was meant, and so I have to find out what is meant, it's giving me a more active um, and more active role, and uh, I have to rethink the relationship to Elizabeth and to Bitterolf, to the other singers, to Wolfram, of course. And uh, so I have to, 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 to display these kinds of relationships and um, it's good to do this, just to, just to, to, to keep up my mind, which is, which is what is going on uh, in the Landgrave while he's doing his speech, which is not, not just conventional. So it helps. Uh, I would say uh, I I really looked forward to be in a, a kind of dinosaur uh, uh, um, production. Uh, we will we will probably face uh, a world without uh, productions like this, uh, or could. Uh, I I think it's a pity to to uh, devote as a as a stage director only to this kind of new law to actualize uh, pieces of art. I, I don't understand this because uh, we don't have to uh, re regard our audience or ourselves as well as non-historic people. I mean, everybody can, can uh, be held responsible to make an effort to understand uh, pieces of art out of their original time. But still, I think we don't have to look for a for a solution for a piece. We 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 must not have to uh, look for a solution for a piece. It's all only a contribution. Every production, every evening, every performance is just a, pro uh, a contribution to a wide range of possible understandings. But I think the advantage of a of a 
production like this for a, a performer is that you have the, uh, the utmost possibility to show psychological developments. Um, if I remember, uh, for instance, uh, the production of uh, Romeo Castellucci in, in Munich and in Salzburg, um, it is very it is very stiff and it, 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 it displays a lot of interesting things, I must say, uh, even if I don't understand it. Uh, um, there are many impressions which I would not uh, like to miss in my life. But uh, the psychological developments in this opera are crucial for me. And it, is, it was very hard to, to, to show them there. Uh, on the other hand, you said you mentioned me strangling Elizabeth during the Evening Star, and it was, I think, it was a, a uh, sorry, don't hate me, it was genius, it was just fantastic, because it, it, give a, it gave a solution to the former mentioned uh, uh, um, difficulty that Elizabeth just disappears. It, it's not, it's not, it's not good. It's not a good solution for a person who dies, uh, not to say how. And she came there in front of it. It was my first production of Tannhäuser. Uh, she came back after, uh, uh, after Wolfram um, asked, could I just go with you? And she says, oh no, leave me alone. And Wolfram is disappointed and she comes back. Oh my God, wow, this is amazing. And she goes to him and, and takes his hands and, oh my God, oh my God, this is what I always was dreaming of. And, and then she settles down with him, takes his hand around her neck and, and shows him during the introduction of the Evening Star, uh, we told this Arnung, please, I need to die. You must, have, uh, you must help me. I, I, I'm not old enough to die. I'm not sick enough to die. There must be a reason. Kill me. Please, yeah. and and he's so much in ecstasy. He kills her and doesn't even doesn't even understand. And then, with these muted horns, after the evening star, he kind of awakes. Oh my, oh God, what is? Oh my God, he killed her. And and he's and and then Tannhäuser reappears, and it is like a reawakening of Raskolnikov. Uh, when he says, oh my God, I killed her, oh God, <gasps> this horror. And, and it's uh, all through this first dialogue, then the Rome tale, and the end, he tries to hide this corpse. And, and uh, especially the guilt, which is always happening, the swap of guilt between uh, Tannhäuser and Wolfram during uh, the Pope's citation, it's always Wolfram, and it, it is Wolfram was provoking Tannhäuser in the in the in the song contest. But also here, it's it's it makes so much more sense that Wolfram is so horribly uh, uh, um, touched by what happened and what he did. It's even more, and it was really great. It was a fantastic solution. If I ever direct a Tannhäuser, I would like to, but I, I don't have the ability. I would, I would ask uh, uh, the director to, to borrow this idea. Well, I wish we had another hour, but we don't. And I just want to thank you all so much for making time for us. <laughs>